Good morning uh, to all those who are in Europe uh, and hello to those who, who are joining us from uh, other parts of the world. My name is Peter Koba and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you at the 13th Dallas and Gatari Studies Conference. We are very sorry um, that we cannot meet you all in Prague uh, as we planned it. Uh, it would be wonderful to have you all here. But uh, as you know, uh, it wasn't possible to uh, make this happen because of COVID-19. Uh, till the very last moment, we were hoping that uh, we would be able to have the conference, I mean the real conference uh, in Prague. But it turned out that uh, it's impossible, not only because uh, uh, the global conference, uh, like Dallas Studies Conference, uh, requires open borders all over the world, but uh, it wouldn't be possible even as a European conference because uh, of uh, the new versions of COVID, uh, even European borders uh, are being uh, shut down again, closed down, and uh, people from Russia and uh, other parts of Europe uh, simply wouldn't be able to be here. So uh, this was the only option to make an online conference. Let us hope that uh, we will still uh, enjoy the meaningful conversation let us hope that uh, we will learn a lot uh, from our keynote speakers. And uh, um, I would also uh, like to mention one important aspect of Dallas and Gatari Studies uh, Conference. As you uh, probably know, part, uh, a big part, in fact, of the registration fee is a yearly subscription to Dallas Studies Journal. So. It's very important to have this kind of conferences because it allows uh, to, us to keep uh, Deleuze Studies Journal uh, alive. Obviously, without subscriptions, um, there will be no journal. And uh, I believe it is quite essential for uh, Deleuze Ogatarian community to have uh, an elite uh, journal uh, where the most up-to-date uh, uh, research is uh, published and uh, communicated. So I don't think it's necessary to uh, introduce Jan uh, to anybody who came across uh, Deleuze and Gattari studies uh, because uh, he is uh, the founder and a uh, very prominent figure in the area of um, Deleuze and Gattari and studies. So I think he's uh, the best person to tell us what's going on now uh, in uh, the area of our research, what has happened in during two years, uh, we were not able to uh, meet. And uh, now uh, I would like to give word to Jan, who will uh, give a talk on assemblage theory today. Uh, I believe his talk will be also related to his most recent book, uh, Assemblage Theory and Method, that appeared in uh, 2020. So, Jan, stage is yours. Okay, well, I was going to have a longer preamble, but I won't uh, carry on anymore, other than to say um, it's very nice to uh, be able to talk to you all from the, from the bottom of the world, and hopefully next year we'll all be drinking a beer somewhere in Mexico City. So as many of you know, um, I have been kind of obsessed with the concept of the assemblage for many years. Um, in fact, it's, it's been nearly 10 years in the making this book um, that I have just written. Um, and I think that, uh, that my interest in it will continue because it's by no means the case that, my, um, that I feel like we've completely figured out what it is. So in, in my uh, recent book, I argue that <clears throat> interest in the concept of the assemblage um, and, in, and in many ways in the work of Deleuze and Guattari itself can be understood as a critical response 
to uh, the growing awareness at the turn of the last century uh, of a new type of social and cultural problem which John Law has described as messy. Um, unhelpfully, Law tends to collapse all non-definite problems into the category uh, of messy, uh, but nevertheless, I think it, it's quite a useful kind of concept for us to have. Um, now, if, as Deleuze says, we have the philosophy we deserve according to how well we formulate our problems, then it is important, I think, that we take the time to think in a clear and definite way about things that are not necessarily clear or definite themselves. In that respect, then, I do not see much advantage in terms like Morton's concept of mesh or Ingold's use of the term assembly, both of which seem to me to push thinking towards the indefinite and the undecided as the best we can hope for, thus making the end point of thinking uh, identical to the starting point, which in a sense amounts to a defeat of thought. As Deleuze and Guattari say, if one concept is better than an earlier one, it is because it makes us aware of new variations and unknown resonances, and it carries out unforeseen cuttings out, as they put it, um, and it brings forth an event. A question should thus be, what does the concept of assemblage enable us to see that we couldn't see before? Now, it seems to me that this question is not asked often enough of pretty much all of Deleuze and Guattari's concepts. Um, and we tend to think of them as being uh, descriptions of things that already exist, whereas they should really be like a scalpel that helps us to cut open the surface of things uh, and see it in a different way. So the answer to this question, uh, which some people have put to themselves, is surprisingly uniform across the spectrum of responses. And in large part, this is because this, what we think of as assemblage theory seems content to rely on only a handful of commentaries on Deleuze and Guattari for their definition of the concept rather than go back to the original source. So, you know, one of my great complaints, um, and if anything was going to make me cranky as an editor of the journal, it's, it is this, that there is a, a sort of a reluctance to, um, in, in many circles, particularly in the social sciences, it has to be said, to actually go to the original sources uh, of Deleuze and Guattari's work and actually try and figure out what those concepts mean. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting situation where there's a, a huge amount of secondary literature, but once we start relying on that secondary literature and, and don't go back and question it, uh, I think we kind of get into a bit of a, a double bind whereby we kind of assume that we know that um, this is what something means, whereas perhaps we should be asking ourselves if we know what it means. Um, now, one reason for this is obviously that the original source, Deleuze and Guattari's work, is complicated um, and it's very difficult to simply strip mine it for definitions. Um, for example, uh, Delander claims that Deleuze and Guattari give assemblage half a dozen different interpretations, uh, which he then claims that he has brought together as a unified concept. Now, the problem with this is that he modifies the concept uh, introducing new ways of thinking about the assemblage as a concept, which on the one hand, he dismisses as harmless additions, and on the other hand, he extols as necessary changes to make the concept immune to certain logical difficulties that, that are, in his view, inherent in the, the original version of the concept. So simplifying Deleuze and Guattari's thought, as Delander tries to do, does not seem to me the right way of going about things, because apart from the sort of weird scholarship model that it entails, um, it seems to me that it, it amounts to an avoidance of conceptual difficulty rather than a working through of it, and therefore it leads to a diminished understanding of the concept. So one of the challenges I've always set myself as, a, as someone who wants to try to teach Deleuze and Guattari to people is to try to figure out a way of making it useful without at the same time having to dumb it down or simplify it or kind of strip away the necessary complexity. Um, I always think if you were to ask yourself, well, what are they trying to do with their concepts? The answer would be something like they're trying to explain the contemporary world in, in all its complexity. So obviously it would be uh, of necessity complex too, since the, the contemporary world is complex. 
Uh, and yet this is not how most commentators seem to want to proceed. Um, and there is a kind of many versions of the assemblage, which to me are, are problematic precisely because they strip away its complexity. So assemblage has become a kind of a received idea that people sort of think they know what it means. Uh, and I, I, I guess I'm wanting to challenge that and ask us to think again about it and to think differently. So accordingly, in recent times, any and everything, or more precisely, and in every kind of collection of thing has come to be thought of or called an assemblage. Um, and even more problematically, the coming together of every kind of collection of things is now referred to as assembling, even though assemblage in Deleuze Guattari's sense and assembling are not linguistically related, but are in fact derived from two different words. So one of the things that I talk about in the book a little bit is how the translation of agencement as assemblage has then created this new verb, assembling, um, which actually has no um, part in anything that Deleuze and Guattari have to say. It would be far more accurate to think of it in terms of arranging. Uh, this constant and seemingly limitless expansion of the terms range of applications begs the question, it seems to me, if any and every kind of thing or collection of thing can be an assemblage, then what is the actual advantage in using this term? Uh, and why not just use some other term? Uh, what makes an assemblage an assemblage and not some other kind of collection of things? So how do we differentiate you know, a pile of, of junk or a heap of fragments from an assemblage? How do we separate the randomly and heterogeneously occurring from that which has its own kind of necessity. So if we don't do this, it don't, we don't move much beyond a highly ambivalent baseline assumption, and we surely have a right to expect more from the concept. So at stake here, I would argue, is the need to distinguish the adjectival from the analytical and to recognize that it is only the latter that is properly philosophical. Our task here then is to isolate and define the specifically Deleuze and Guattari species of assemblage and evaluate it against other varieties on offer. More often than not, this will entail an examination of the hybrids on offer uh, and asking what is gained and what is lost in the changes enacted. So although at its core, assemblage theory clearly arose out of the work of Deleuze and Guattari, uh, particularly A Thousand Plateaus, but um, you know, the, the real origin of the concept and the term, uh, in fact, is the, the Kafka book. Uh, that's where they really start to first work it out. But A Thousand Plateaus should be considered a, a further refinement of it. Um, it assemblage theory sort of acknowledges that as its orange, uh, origin, but uh, frequently departs from it. So actor network theory um, which obviously ar arises out of the work of Bruno Latour uh, and New Materialism, which arises from the work of Manuel de Landa, Jane Bennett, William Connolly, among others. Uh, examples of bodies of work that fall into the category of assemblage theory and acknowledge a debt to the work of Deleuze and Guattari, but nonetheless go about things in their own way, um, often in ways that I would suggest is kind of at odds with the, uh, with the original. Um, and, I mean, Delander admits as much when he describes his work as a kind of Deleuze 2.0. Now, the difficulties don't stop there because there is also a considerable body of work that falls under the heading of assemblage theory that not only owes nothing to the work of Deleuze and Qatari, but doesn't even bear a family resemblance to it um, in, this, in the ways that ANT and New Materialism do. So there can be no question that the concept of assemblage has generated interesting new ways of thinking about the nature of social reality. Um, but in the evolutionary leap it made from the from being a concept confined to the work of Deleuze and Guattari to a sort of global theory, it has also drifted a long way from its origins uh, and in the process created a number of difficulties that we need to try to figure out. Now, one may well answer this by saying that Deleuze and Guattari themselves do not call for a strict adherence to their ideas. Um, and in one sense, this is certainly true. But Deleuze also said that in, in his own appropriations of other philosophers, which he freely admitted and described as monstrous, were also true 
to their original authors. It was important to him, he said, that he didn't put words in their mouth and that the child he made with them was unmistakably their offspring. So it is my contention that most of the existing appropriations of Deleuze Muttari's work within assemblage theory do not meet this standard and that this matters because the versions of assemblage theory that have given us are in several ways uh, inferior to the original to the point where one is in fact forced to call into question their parentage. Now, I know it's unfashionable to uh, to critique in any serious way appropriations of Deleuze and Guattari, but I think it's important. I think if we don't make the effort to try to make judgments about what we think of as being accurate or inaccurate uh, appropriations, interpretations or uses of Deleuze and Guattari, then as a field, we kind of uh, fall into a sort of an abyss. So assemblages have in many ways been reduced to a, a kind of an apparatus, uh, which is precisely not what Deleuze and Guattari intended. And in fact, they constantly caution against us taking this mechanistic view of things. The second um, casualty of, of this interpretation has been the multidimensional nature of the concept of the assemblage. Uh, and this manifests itself in two ways. On the one hand, the assemblage is treated as a standalone concept, uh, which it isn't. Uh, you cannot really think about it without also having to think about the notion of the body that organs, the abstract machine, uh, as well as deterritorialization. And on the other hand, the assemblage is treated as though it consists of only one component, namely the machinic, which is similarly wrong because the uh, the assemblage always has at least two components, the machinic and the enunciative, if you like. So as a consequence, much of what goes by the name of assemblage theory is kind of an emaciated version of what Deleuze and Guattari actually tried to develop. Uh, and I think we no need to try to figure out how to um, give it some more body. Uh, and one of the best ways to do this, I think, is to actually return directly to Deleuze and Guattari's work uh, and try to develop our own version uh, directly from their work and more or less kind of put to one side some of these other secondary versions that have uh, come into being over time. Now, having said that, I tend to treat assemblage theory as an incomplete project that invites us to develop it further on the basis of uh, what they call first principles. Um, the latter are developed throughout Deleuze and Guattari's work but there is a kind of coded summary of it in the chapter, The Geology of Morals, which is obviously intended as a kind of route map, albeit a coded one, uh, for the entire uh, schizoanalytic project, of which assemblage theory is but one part. And in that sense, it makes kind of a nice starting place for any sort of voyage into Deleuze and Guattari's work, and particularly any voyage into trying to understand what they meant by schizoanalysis. Um, if any chapter could be described as playful or poetic, it would certainly be the geology of morals chapter, which is which is clearly uh, written as a kind of allegory, uh, and thus making it far from easy to follow. But I think if you read it carefully, it does yield uh, a handful of what I would want to call foundational propositions that we can use as a point of entry into uh, schizoanalysis uh, in general. And so like per, uh, Poe's per purloined letter, these propositions are hidden in plain sight. Uh, and for that reason, obviously, they can be very difficult to see. Uh, not only that, one always has the feeling, or maybe it's just me, um, that someone is seeing what you cannot, uh, which can be discouraging. Um, however, we cannot all be like Monsieur Dupin and instantly see through every ruse. So we have to develop ways of stepping back and finding the right perspective to obtain our clear view. And ultimately, we simply need to trust in their advice that we will be, and here I'm quoting, in a position to understand it later on and resist the urge to seek what Jamison has uh, hilariously called the mischief of premature clarification. So in the dialogue between Deleuze and Foucault, uh, subsequently titled Intellectuals and Power, Deleuze says a theory is exactly like a box of tools. Um, it must be useful, it must function. Uh, 
He goes on to say that like a new pair of glasses, uh, an image which he attributes to Proust, it should be used to see something outside and beyond its point of origin in a specific work. To read Proust is to see the whole of France's second empire laid out on the dissecting table. Similarly, to read Deleuze and Guattari is to see the whole of late capitalism laid out on a dissecting table. Now, doubtless this accounts for the, the notorious complexity of their work. Um, as I mentioned before, its intellectual ambitions are literally uh, boundless, uh, nothing less than a complete history of the present of desire, if you like. Um, however, as, as vast as it is in scope, um, there are still ways by which we can uh, draw out of it um, a sort of useful uh, methodology. Now, as Deleuze writes in Difference to Repetition, the problem of where to begin is always problematic. He says, it's always been regarded as a very delicate problem, for beginning means eliminating all presuppositions. In philosophy, he says, presuppositions come in two forms, which he describes as objective and subjective, and it is all too easy to refuse the former, only to fall back on the latter without even knowing it. And Deleuze gives the example of Descartes, who, because he did not want to define humans as rational animals, which presupposes the concepts of rationality and animality in an objective sense, instead he proposed the model of the cogito in terms of a thinking subject. In doing so, he claimed to have escaped the pitfall of objective presupposition, but it is clear, Deleuze says, that he has not escaped the subterranean danger of subjective presupposition because his definition of the cogito assumes that everybody knows independently of concepts what is meant by self, thinking, and being. Descartes, I think, only appears to be a philosophical beginning because it has buried its presuppositions in the empirical realm of the self. In this way, it fails to question what it necessarily presupposes. And Deleuze similarly taxes Hegel and Heidegger for making the same kind of error. How then are we to avoid making the same mistake ourselves? We must, he says, find the modesty to not know what everybody knows and to not recognize what everybody is supposed to recognize. Only then can we proceed without presuppositions. Um, and that's what I have tried to do as I was writing this book about assemblage theory and what I'm sort of advocating for here is to try to find a way of stepping back and, and sort of agreeing with ourselves that we don't really know what assemblage means um, and then to try to proceed without presupposition, without thinking that we know what the answer is. Uh, and certainly, as I was rereading Deleuze and Guattari for the, you know, what feels like the millionth time in order to write the book on assemblage theory and, and subsequent work that I've been doing, um, it really did feel like it was a kind of a, a relief to think, well, what if I didn't know what this meant? Uh, and, and I tried to approach it differently. And what I tried to do was to ask the question, well, how does it work? How do all these pieces work together and what gives them their necessity? Now, inevitably, this brings us to the question, I guess, um, which not even the authors seem to avoid, of how should we read Deleuze and Guattari? Um, their work, as I've mentioned, is, is obviously playful and poetic. Uh, and there are, of course, varying opinions as to how we should proceed. Uh, it is my sense that Brian Masumi's advice that we should approach a thousand plateaus as one does a record, which is a now uh, marvelously outdated technological reference. I suppose the contemporary equivalent would be uh, a YouTube or Spotify playlist. He says we should approach it like that and which it would allow us to skip sections. Um, and I, I think this idea has had the most traction of all the bits of advice out there. Uh, and in many ways, obviously, this would come as, as a relief to anyone wanting to read Deleuze, because if you have permission to skip ahead, then you don't have to worry too much about the difficulty. Um, but it is my sense that this is actually probably quite bad advice, um, and with, with due apologies to Brian. Um, but I think that the, the problem with it is that it assumes either that one can come to grips with the central argument of Deleuze and Guattari's work in an ad hoc way, or 
that there is no essential argument that one needs to come to grips with and that the work itself is ad hoc. Now, while it is true that there are high levels of redundancy between the chapters, such that if one misses something in one place, uh, one may pick it up elsewhere. So the concept of body organs is mentioned in several chapters, not just the one uh, apparently dedicated to it. But there is also synthesis, which demands that certain things be read in sequence. I mean, Deleuze and Guattari themselves say that the chapters are like a set of split rings. You can fit any one of them into any other, which is fine. But I think it's also a kind of a trap for the unwary because it's also the case that concepts evolve and even change name and appearance in the book. And Deleuze and Guattari even uh, change their minds about some things sort of mid midstream, as it were. Um, the concept of the body that organs is the most obvious case in this. If you pay attention to the evolution of that concept throughout even just the book of A Thousand Plateaus, you find that by the end of the book, it's really become the plane of imminence and they don't really talk about the body that organs anymore. And certainly when you get to what is philosophy, the body that organs has disappeared from view completely. Uh, so it's quite important to bear that in mind that, you know, there is a sort of synthetic development of the concepts um, such that you can't really say that if you've only read uh, Anti-Oedipus, for example, that you actually know what the body of organs really means as a concept, because in fact it, it evolves and it changes and, and the concept is not the same thing by the time you get to the last works. Now, if I were to use a musical analogy myself, um, then I would say that A Thousand Plateaus is composed in, in, in sort of the same way as, as what in symphonies is known as a, as a sort of theme and variation model, whereby a musical motif is introduced and steadily varied throughout the composition until it becomes all but unrecognizable. Uh, and, and the third movement of Beethoven's Ninth is one of the more well-known examples of this. And variation is itself an essential un idea underpinning the entire schizoanalytic project. Uh, so this analogy is, in a sense, doubly appropriate. Variation can only be appreciated fully if one has a sense of the whole piece, which one simply cannot get by skipping sections or listening to it out of sequence. It is true that Deleuze and Guattari do say that a thousand plateaus can be read in any order, but they also say that the conclusion can only be read at the end, that is, when one has a solid grasp of the project. In other words, it doesn't matter how you get to an understanding of the whole, just so long as you do. My sense, though, is that that is bad advice because reading it out of sequence compounds the possibilities of misunderstanding by creating the false impression that the work isn't underpinned by a coherent logic or building towards a composite understanding. It is also true that Deleuze says that it's good to read a book as one listens to a record but I would argue his purpose is to put the book on the same level as music and film and cultural arts in general, not to suggest, as Masumi implies, that one should allow one's taste to dictate one's progress through the work. So this problem of how to approach A Thousand Plateaus, which Masumi rightly broaches, is raised to an even greater order of difficulty when one asks, where in fact does A Thousand Plateaus begin and where does it end? Does it begin with Antiedipus, or does one need to go further back? And does it end with what is philosophy? Does it include everything Deleuze and Guattari wrote separately after A Thousand Plateaus was published? Should one also read all their source material as well? I have always thought that Deleuze and Guattari only really had one project, which was the invention of schizoanalysis, and that it began before they met and then it continued after they stopped explicitly working together and it continued after their deaths. It continued because it couldn't be brought to completion by them um, because there is always something new to consider and because the conditions that prompted its invention, namely late capitalism, are still with us today. So Deleuze was already working on a version of schizoanalysis even before he met Guattari just as Guattari was already working on a version of schizoanalysis before he met Deleuze. Uh, and this, as legend has it, is how and why they met. Deleuze wanted to talk to someone who worked with schizophrenics in order to test certain ideas he was developing about the language of schizophrenia, 
and his former student suggested he get in touch with Guattari. Meanwhile, Guattari had been working on some ideas about the machinic way schizophrenia worked using Deleuze's book, The Logic of Sense. So when he was offered the chance to meet Deleuze, he didn't hesitate. Now, their relationship has been caricatured by people who should know better, namely Alain Badiou and Slavoj Žižek, among others, as one in which the pure philosopher Deleuze uh, was politicised by the activist Guattari. But aside from the bad faith of such judgment, this caricature fails to pay attention to what they themselves say about their collaboration. In dialogues, um, Deleuze says, um, sorry, Deleuze tells a beautiful story about the way he worked with Guattari that makes it clear that it wasn't a simple case of one radicalizing the other. And Deleuze has his own word for it. He calls it a pickup procedure, um, which he takes from, from Burroughs. He says, Felix was working on black holes. This astronomical idea fascinated him. The black hole is what captures you and does not let you go. I was working rather on a white wall. And what is a white wall but a screen? And how do you plane down the wall and make a line of flight pass? We had not brought the two ideas together, but we noticed that each was tending of its own accord towards the other to produce something which, indeed, was neither in the one nor the other. For black holes on a white wall are, in fact, a face. And now it no longer resembles a face, it is rather an assemblage or the abstract machine which produces the face. And suddenly the problem bounces back and it is political, which societies and civilizations need this machine to function. Uh, end of quote. And every one of their concepts can be traced back to this singular question, which is not how does it work, but why is it happening? In order to answer this question, they draw on the resources of every available intellectual system, which is what Deleuze means by his pickup method. It implies a convergence and a collaboration between all forms of scholarly endeavor. In many ways, it is this aspect of their work that has been the most influential, especially, uh, and ironically, I guess, with scholars who do not read their work. So although it draws disconcert on a disconcertingly heterogeneous range of material, uh, and here it helps to remember that they enlisted the aid of their students to compile the material over the course of their several years of teaching together, it is nonetheless a highly coherent body of work, and it is precisely the assemblage understood as a multidimensional concept that holds the whole thing together. Now, the, the idea that the concept of the assemblage is the engine that drives Deleuze and Guattari's entire project is in fact signaled by Deleuze himself in three brief remarks that he makes in interviews that were given following the publication of A Thousand Plateaus. Asked point blank what holds A Thousand Plateaus together, Deleuze replies, I think it is the idea of an assemblage which replaces the idea of desiring machines. And as Deleuze explains in the discussion following his 1973 conference presentation, which is published in English as Five Propositions on Psychoanalysis, he and Guattari felt compelled to jettison the term desiring machine because they felt trapped by it. Too many people were using it, co-opting it, and thereby domesticating it. Uh, and one can only imagine how they would feel about the assemblage if they were alive today. Only a year after the publication of Anti-Oedipus, Deleuze and Guattari were already concerned that Desiring Machine had lost its capacity to upset people. But they were also moving on conceptually, and in this sense, the concept of the assemblage is not merely a new word for an old concept, it is also a point of departure. It answers to a new problematic. As Deleuze explains in an interview uh, published in um, The Liberation, upon the publication of A Thousand Plateaus, the aim of the new book is, he says, to interrogate the circumstances in which things happen, in what situations, where and when do, does a particular thing happen, how does it happen, and so on. The assemblage then is intended to answer several types of questions, how, why, when, and not just what questions. So this would be a, a very simple test of, of any kind of um, 
use of the concept of the assemblage that one encounters to see what questions it asks and to see whether or not it asks more than one type of question. Um, and as I'm suggesting, it should be asking how questions and why questions and when questions, not just what questions. Uh, this leads me to a second point I want to underscore uh, that also goes, in my view, to the heart of the entire Schizoanalytic project. Uh, Deleuze says that he and Guattari are trying to substitute the idea of the assemblage for the idea of behaviour, whence the importance, he says, of ethology and the analysis of animal assemblages, uh, for example, territorial assemblages, to which he adds an important and often overlooked clarification. The assemblage, he says, is first of all the problem of consistency and that this is prior to the problem of behavior. So ethology is a means of formulating a problem, namely the problem of desire. It is not the answer to the problem, nor the means to answering the problem. And the same must be said for all the scientific research that Deleuze and Guattari draw on. They use it to formulate problems and create concepts, not as reference material. While it is obvious Deleuze and Guattari drew a great deal of inspiration from the work of Uxku, uh, Tim Bergen, Lawrence, and so on, it is equally clear that their work departs quite fundamentally from that as well. If we must connect it to ethology, then I think we need to see it as a reinvention of ethology rather than an extension of it. One that instigates a radical shift of ground away from an idea of nature dominated by the involuntary promptings of our base instincts, however we might want to conceive those. If we don't, then the risk is that we will reduce the assemblage to a biological system or worse, a set of instincts that governs behavior in a determinate manner, when precisely the opposite of that is what is at stake. To put it another way, it would not be much of a victory if we broke free of the iron grip of Freud's eatable model only to wind up in a similarly restrictive uh, arms of Uxkul. Uh, for as interesting and as insightful as Uxkul's work is, it only offers the most marginal of insights into the complexities of human behavior in the 20th and 21st centuries. And it's more than clear um, that Deleuze and Guattari ultimately thought that the notion of behavior as it had been formulated in ethology was in fact flawed. Uh, putting it very simply, they, they see the stimulus and response model as being insufficient to explain uh, contemporary human behaviour. And the third remark that I think helps us to see that um, the importance of the assemblage is this. Deleuze says that he and Guattari have themselves only begun to develop what he refers to as the general logic of assemblages and he expects that completing it will occupy them in the future. Now, sadly, this does not seem to have been the case, although who knows, um, I mean, in some ways it, it's, it's, I think, buried beneath um, some of the later work. Certainly, I would argue that you can't really understand the cinema books without taking into account the idea of the assemblage. Um, but they didn't write about assemblages directly in their collaborative work. Uh, what is philosophy moves away from the central themes of uh, anti-Oedipus and a thousand plateaus and takes a kind of inward turn. From the perspective of assemblage theory, though, it adds very little except the important reminder that chaos is the essential ground zero for desire. Um, it is, in other words, what desire looks like in its free state. Um, Deleuze's own books written in between a thousand plateaus and what is philosophy uh, again, add little to the assemblage project directly, uh, although, as I said, the cinema books could. By contrast, Guattari's work in the years after A Thousand Plateaus are almost exclusively devoted to the development and expansion of the general logic of assemblages. Um, and I think that what's important here is, is, and I want to underscore this, is the idea that they both thought that assemblage theory has a general logic. Um, and, you know, if there was... Uh, time to run, you know, a couple of weeks worth of seminars on, on Deleuze Guattari's work, one of the key questions that I would want to get us all to address would be, well, what is this general logic? Can it be adduced? 
I think what it means for us now is that we cannot start from a single assemblage and work our way up. We kind of have to start all at once, as one does with language, according to Deleuze Guattari. Second, the, the fact that Deleuze Guattari saw their project as incomplete means not only that we have an opportunity to complete it ourselves, but also that we need to be vigilant against premature attempts to bring the process to a close, which in my view would only be possible if history itself had come to a standstill. Asked if it wasn't a paradox for a work like A Thousand Plateaus to consider it a self a system, Deleuze said while it had become commonplace to say knowledge systems have broken down and that knowledge is so fragmented that it was no longer possible to construct systems, it was completely false to think that systems thinking had lost its power. There are, he says, and I'm quoting, two problems with this idea. People can't imagine doing any serious work on very restricted and specific little series. Worse still, any broader approach is left to the spurious work of visionaries with anyone saying whatever comes into their head, end of quote. Despite the various critiques of post-structuralism, post-modernism and deconstruction, systems have not lost their philosophical power, according to Deleuze, because they have been rethought as open rather than closed systems. What I and Guattari call a rhizome, he says, is precisely an open system. Deleuze and Guattari were not, as many people seem to think, opposed to the idea of something being expressible as a whole. Indeed, the reality is without it, neither the abstract machine nor the body that organs nor the assemblage would be thinkable as concepts. But Deleuze and Guattari conceive of the concept of the whole, borrowing from Proust, as a product produced as nothing more than a part alongside other parts, which it neither unifies nor totalizes, though it has an effect on these other parts because it establishes paths of communication between non-communicating vessels transverse unities between universe unities between elements that retain all their differences with their own particular boundaries. As they go on to say, the whole is poorly understood if it is treated as either the sum of its parts or an original totality. Rather, as with Proust's novel, it comes into being as the synthetic product of the work and at the same time sits above the work in what they call superlinearity simultaneously surveying every corner of its created universe uh, and policing its boundaries. Now I'm kind of conscious of the time and I do want to allow some time for questions. Um, so in order to have some questions, I'll take a breather for a moment. If anyone has questions, you can put them up on the chat line and I will try to respond to them. Um, and then and if there aren't questions, then I'll continue with the with a monologue, but I would be grateful for some questions. So please do feel free to fire them at me. Can't promise I can answer, but I will try. Maybe um, it will take some time till people type their questions. So I suggest you uh, keep talking. And in the meantime, uh, people can write their questions and we will get back to them if you agree. And here is the first question. So people yeah, see, are reacting okay. quite quickly. So it's up to you, uh, whatever you prefer. Yeah, I'll take some questions. Um... So the first question, can I talk more about the relationship between assemblage uh, and the cinema books? And then Stephen, hey Stephen, how are you doing? Um, could I comment on the relationship between multiplicity and the assemblage? Um, and then we've got the Kafka book. So, okay, so just hold on for a minute. I'm going to lose all these questions if I don't... Uh, Okay, 
Uh, now it seems that uh, Jan disappeared, uh, but hopefully he will get back soon and uh, he will be able to answer at least some of those questions that are appearing in the chat. And uh, above all, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we could hear and enjoy Jan's talk. Uh, of course, it's quite stressful when the conference begins uh, with a delay and uh, non-functional connection. So let us hope that uh, this will not appear again. But I would like to take this opportunity and uh, encourage all of you to uh, join your panels uh, 15 minutes before the start. So this is precisely the time you can arrange your talks and you can make sure your connection works uh, well. And uh, we could uh, also avoid possible problems in those 15 minutes. So please make sure you join your sessions and panels 15 minutes before they start and uh, you can uh, also discuss possible technical issues with the chairs. So this would allow us to uh, avoid uh, any delays in the program. But now, Jan, uh, the, I give you the word again. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I uh, Oh, my God. This uh, is crazy. So let me go where we get to. So we had the f question about assemblage and the cinema books. I mean, that's it's really kind of complicated question to try to answer, and I'm not sure that I can can do it justice. Um, but I think if you look at what he's trying to talk about with the cinema books, that on the one hand you have a kind of uh, an aesthetic description, obviously, um, but also that you you can't really understand how the the various shots and everything all hold together without starting to think about it in terms of an assemblage. So the very idea of the sort of sensory motor image as being a kind of cognitive system that holds the images together and allows us to make sense of it is, in fact, uh, a notion of the assemblage. Um, Stephen's question on the relationship between the multiplicity and the assemblage. Yeah, look, it's, it's obviously important to think about the assemblage in terms of multiplicity. One of the, in, in my way of thinking about it, one of the key things or key implications of thinking about it as a multiplicity in Deleuze and Guattari's sense is that you cannot simply um, add or subtract elements from an assemblage. So Deleuze and Guattari's key definition of the idea of the multiplicity is that it is dimensional, not simply kind of made up of components. So you can't add or subtract anything without changing the whole thing. So one of the ways by which um, the assemblage has been thought of is if we think of it just as an aggregate so if you think about jane bennett's way she talks about the assemblage then the assemblage just seems to be something that can be limitlessly added to subtracted from etc cetera, etc cetera, and it's kind of amorphous um whereas it's clearly not what deleuze watari is saying if, if the assemblage is a multiplicity then it's um its components are defined and you cannot add or subtract to it without changing the whole and i think that's quite crucial um, the next question, you said that the assemblage is a multidimensional concept. Uh, what dimensions does it include? So basically, I'm, I'm saying that you cannot think about the assemblage in the absence of the body without organs or the abstract machine. That To think of it on its own as a kind of a nonsense because the assemblage is what is needed to realise and to bring into being the uh, body without organs, which we can think of as, as the plane of imminence. And at the same time, the assemblage doesn't have its, its structure or its purpose or its meaning without uh, the abstract machine. So we have to think of it on a sort of multidimensional, uh, in a multidimensional way. Uh, and then likewise, across the, um, the body without organs, the plane of imminence, one has to think about the movement of deterritorialization. So you can't think of the assemblage by itself and on its own. Um, next question, what about the elaboration of assemblage in the Kafka book? Can one take that as part of this theory and how? So my sense is that the elaboration of the assemblage in the Kafka book should be regarded as a kind of rough draft of what happens in uh, A Thousand Plateaus. 
so in in my view it it helps us to see what they were trying to achieve because it, it clearly functions at the level of trying to answer to very specific kinds of problems that they raise with Kafka's work. But the way that they deal with it is is nowhere near as complex and as sophisticated as the version that we get in A Thousand Plateaus. So if we were to argue that A Thousand Plateaus offers us the most sophisticated version, then the Kafka books offer us a kind of preliminary version. It would be kind of false to use them as the definitive form because they clearly are not. Um, but what I think is really interesting about the Kafka book that helps us to understand A Thousand Plateaus better is that they they start by asking a, a really kind of simple and at the same time complicated problem, which is why couldn't um, Kafka publish, but also why couldn't he finish his novels? So what was, what was about the novel that was somehow impossible for him to complete? Um, why did he need to write so many letters? How do the short stories function? And each of these kinds of questions are then answered in terms of uh, thinking about the, the specific genre of the letter and of the short story and of the novel as particular kinds of assemblages that he that they connect to uh, Deleuze and Guattari's idea of desire. So that's how I would use them. I would use it as, as a preliminary way of beginning to understand the more complex and sophisticated version that one finds in A Thousand Plateaus. But I also take from it the, um, the, the, the questions that they ask with respect to Kafka. Uh, so, uh, uh, Angelica, at the beginning, I insisted on the necessity to keep in mind the two sides of the assembly machine on the one hand and unsuitable on the other. Uh, I wonder if you could explain in more detail or put more concretely why and how does the enunciative um, escape the machinic? Yeah, look, I think this is one of the really important questions that arises out of the work on on the notion of the assemblage. <clears throat> so in my book on assemblage um, theory, I give the example in the final chapter about the notion of, of housing, okay? And so say, and so this is based on the work of a friend of mine, um, Tess Lee, who wrote a book about, uh, among other things, um, uh, policy relating to Indigenous people in Australia. And so I say, look, if you look at, at housing and you look at it through the lens of policy, on the one hand, you have a kind of machinic, uh, kind of physical, empirical um, content, namely the actual materials of the house. And then on the other hand, you have uh, the policy that relates to how those materials uh, should be able to operate. And so if you ask the question, well, what constitutes the, the proper material for a house? That is not, strictly speaking, a material question because you could make a house out of anything if you wanted to. You can make it out of old bits of cars. You can use straw. You can use mud or whatever. But within contemporary Western society, we do not deem those to be the proper materials out of which to make a house. So therefore, the enunciative side, the policy side, if you like, actually has a very, very important influence on what we regard as the material or the machinic side. By the same token, the machinic side, the possibilities of the materials themselves also then give rise to certain kinds of enunciative implications. As new materials become available, for example, new materials that have better insulation than, than previously used materials, then policy changes to reflect that, such that the new houses as they are built must reflect the possibilities of these new types of material. So I think what's really interesting to work through with the idea of the assemblage is the way that the material and the enunciative are independent uh, formations that nevertheless interact with one another uh, to produce quite interesting results and that we can't really explain day-to-day -day life if we look at only one or the other. And so my complaint against um, a lot of new materialism is that they tend to ignore the enunciative side of things and, and sort of proceed as though it were possible to explain things on the basis of the material itself. And I would suggest that that's not possible, that one must encounter the um, enunciative side as well. Um, and I think that's, this, you know, you can see this in many ways going back to Foucault, like discipline and punish is the same thing. 
he's not interested in just the, the nature of the prison. Rather, he asks, well, what kinds of social conditions had to arise in order for the prison to exist and to function in the way that it did? And that there were debates about, you know, the way that the prison ought to function that happened independently of the actual physical nature of the prison itself. And those debates go on. Um, next question, is there uh, necessarily an ethical dimension of the assemblage? And can we talk about assemblages of control, for example? I think there is necessarily an ethical dimension to any discussion about the assemblage. Um, and Deleuze and Guattari are fairly reticent about talking about uh, ethics in any particular way, but whenever Deleuze does talk about it, his way of defining it is to say, whenever we are talking about something that counts as the normal, then there is an ethical debate. So it seems to me that with assemblages, there is a kind of um, built in, if you like, drive towards a certain kind of normalization. Um, and that, you know, when we think about vast assemblages like schools and, and prisons and hospitals and so forth of the kind that, that Foucault also described, there is a sort of constant normalizing tendency built into those particular institutions, those particular types of assemblages, um, and that we can certainly raise uh, ethical questions within that. Uh, and obviously, too, the, the notion of control clearly does raise ethical questions as well. Um, I think that the you know the, inter the interesting thing about control and its kind of cognates with um, biopower, and I think you know obviously COVID has brought this to our attention more clearly than than anything else ever has, is that you know in a way we seem to want control, like you know as provocative as it is to say this. We do want control. Like I, mean, I look at it from the perspective of Australia looking at the US under Trump. Uh, and I think, you know, most of the world was kind of looking at Trump thinking, this, you know, the one thing that was absolutely missing from his response to COVID was any sense of control. Like the one thing that was missing was biopower in the way that Foucault described it. He didn't follow all the disciplinary procedures of locking it down, closing borders, isolating people, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. He didn't do any of those things, um, and for many of us, that seemed completely um, negligent on his part. And of course, the U.S. has paid an extremely high high price in in loss of life. So I think it's important to think about the um, the ambiv the ambivalences that we have towards control and towards biopower in general, because on some level we do want it. Like however much we might want to say it goes overboard, like I would argue that Australia's treatment of, of people who want to come to our country for uh, asylum purposes is abominable. That, you know, we should should open our borders to these people and allow them to have asylum as, and a safe place to live. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't think that some of the control measures that were put in place to restrict the spread of COVID as a disease in this country were wrong. So I think it's hard for us to deal with, with control and biopower uh, without having to recognise that we actually are deeply ambivalent about it. Uh, Catherine Anderson, can you speak to any tension or and or connection between assemblages as self-creating or as created and arranged for uh, purpose? Yeah, look, this is a really fascinating question. Um, it's hard to know whether or not one can see assemblages as being self-creating. Like, what I mean, what would that actually mean? Do they just kind of spontaneously arise? Um, I don't know that I think that, that that necessarily happens. Can assemblages simply arise without some kind of a subject uh, at the center of it? My problem would be with that, that seems to me to leave open the problem of well, what would be their necessity? What would be their purpose? Why would they even exist? if there wasn't some kind of uh, central motivating force. So I'm not, like, I think that there are various people who sort of interpret the Deleuze Guattari's interest in autopoiesis as being a kind of interest in self-creation. But autopoiesis doesn't mean self-creation, and Haraway is surprisingly wrong about this. Autopoiesis means self-sustaining. And I think that is a more important way of thinking about assemblages, that they are self-sustaining, but you know, one can also see them in the way of, if you think about 
OCD, for example. OCD is an assemblage that is self-sustaining, but it is also kind of self-limiting as well. Um, and that's why Deleuze and Guattari have the concept of the rhizome as our way of trying to get out of particular kinds of assemblages that we can get ourselves stuck into. So I guess my answer would be that I don't think that there are that it's useful for us to think about self-creating assemblages, but rather that assemblages are created and arranged for a purpose, for sure, but we may not always know what that purpose is. Uh, we might not consciously create an assemblage like this is what I'm creating for myself, but nevertheless, we could be creating assemblages that we feel that we need, even if we were not able to articulate it for ourselves. Um, and in fact, I've been writing about this recently uh, and one of the questions that I've been sort of dealing with is uh, uh, talking about people who do triathlons. Um, and, you know, in various interviews, people say that I, they did it out of boredom. But it seems to me that boredom doesn't really explain anything. Um, so I'm kind of wary of, of those kinds of answers. Uh, so I talked about the necessary complexity in Deleuze and Guattari's scholarship. You also said how not every collection is an assemblage. Could you share with us what it is an assemblage in our contemporary reality, especially in political institutions? Yeah, look, again, a really vital question. Um, the, the shortest answer to that question is that Deleuze and Guattari specify that every assemblage is also an event, okay? That, in other words, there cannot be an assemblage that is not also an event. An event, as they define it then, is some kind of a, a rupture or a discontinuity in the continuum of things, so that we know an event has happened because we can point to it in a way that, in very simple terms, is before and after. So we cannot talk about an assemblage if we can't also talk about some form of transformation. Uh, and, and probably the most common form of transformation at the heart of the assemblage is what Deleuze Buttari referred to as the incorporeal transformation. Um, and, and that goes to the idea of performativity. So if you look, you know, you can look here at, at the work of Judith Butler, for example, who I think rightly and, and uh, incredibly insightfully says something which is works very well with Deleuze Guattari's work, which is that the very idea of gender itself as a performative is also an ongoing incorporeal transformation. So that we are already in the midst of a particular kind of assemblage. Um, and one of the difficulties that we have of trying to deal with that assemblage is that in order to break out of it, we would also need to institute some new kind of an event that brings about a new kind of an assemblage. Um, but the, the you know, gender as an assemblage is incredibly elastic, um, such that we can stretch it in all directions, but we haven't, I think, yet broken out of it, um, its boundaries uh, yet. So that would be one version. I think the other obvious um, assemblage that is also found in what Deleuze and Guattari are saying and has a number of, of different permutations has to has to do with the idea of people kind of voting against their interest and the sort of global uh, turn to the right in many uh, first world um, countries like America, um, but also in places like India, um, whereby the uh, the people seem to be voting for uh, basically fascistic types of regimes that that do not seem to have the interests of the people um, in, in, you know, at their kind of primary. And that it raises the question, well, why would people do this? Why won't they vote for uh, parties that offer to do something much more concretely for them? And I think that's a really crucial assemblage that we would need to try to explain because it has brought about any number of incorporeal transformations that need to be tracked and traced. But, you know, one of the clearest of those transformations is the idea um, that, you know, politics is really about individual achievement, individual resilience, um, that, you know, taxes are a kind of evil, that we shouldn't uh, expect government to do anything for us, et cetera, et cetera. All these transformations uh, to the way we think about what constitutes good government uh, have all been um, in the nature of incorporeal transformations that we could track uh, to assemblages. Okay, so we've probably got time for the last two questions here and then... Um, We'll have to finish. Could I talk a little bit more about the evolution 
of the notions of the plane of imminence and plane of consistence uh, and assemblage. So very, very quickly, um, the first appearance of the notion of the body without organs is in the book, The Logic of Sense, where it is uh, taken directly from Melanie Klein's work and is correlated to what uh, Klein referred to as the liquid object, which she opposed to the so-called anal object. So in its first form, the liquid object or the body without organs as it is talked about in the logic of sense was a kind of mechanism of defense, okay? So this carries over into uh, anti-Oedipus where they talk about Arto who says, you know, I don't want to, um, any organs, I want to have a body that, without organs. What he's effectively saying is that there are various things that are kind of making demands upon him that he can't tolerate anymore. So therefore he wants to have a body without organs, namely a body that is able to resist these intolerable demands on his body. But in that sense, it's still framed as a very negative kind of concept. And they uh, confirm this by correlating it with the notion of the catatonic schizophrenic in the um, uh, in the asylum. But when you get to a thousand plateaus, now they're asking the question, well, is it possible to have an affirmative body without organs? And when they ask the question, how do we make ourselves a body without organs? They are effectively asking, well, how is it possible to make a version of the body without organs that is in fact affirmative? And this is a radical departure from the earlier books because now it's no longer a matter of the catatonic body resisting all these kind of terrible demands upon it. Now they're saying it's possible for you to develop your own body without organs that will enable you to do positive, affirmative kinds of things. Uh, and that's really crucial. And then when you get to what is philosophy, they stop talking about the body without organs, but they are still talking about the plane of imminence. And we can understand the plane of imminence as being simply the state of mind, if you like, in which the things that you are doing make sense which you would then have to ask the question, well, how do I get to that position such that these things make sense? And that in a sense is really what the body that organs is in its most practical uh, reality. Um, and that the assemblage is the sits on top of that as the means that we have of constructing these body that organs. So the example they give is of masochism, of the masochist uh, elaborate sort of uh, sexual setup. But they say what he's trying to do is to not so much create pleasure as to create a body that organs, create the possibility for themselves for the world to make sense. Uh, could I say something more about the idea of reading Deleuze and Guattari since concepts uh, evolve, as you pointed out, and then perhaps proceed with the concept on, um, and then in perhaps proceed with the concept on Asian small collective denunciation in Kafka and thanks in advance. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure what I'm being asked to say here, but yes, certainly one should follow the evolution of it. Um, the, the very quick answer to your question, Ava, is that when you move from the Kafka book to A Thousand Plateaus, then the thing that you have to pay attention to is that the uh, collective enunciation um, side of things is in fact theorized through the notion of territory. So in effect, that is what you have to think about territory deterritorialization and so forth takes place in the, the collective enunciation. Um, and then the last question, I read your book and paper about the OECD policymaking and I believe that it's a very important conversation that you started. Well, uh, thank you very much, although I was only the, the least important author on that particular paper, so I will pass on your good words to my co-authors who are the real experts on the OECD. I wrote the Deleuze bits, they wrote the OECD bits. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I believe I have exactly one minute and 26 seconds left. So uh, thank you, Peter, for inviting me to open this conference. It has been a pleasure. My apologies for the various uh, technological glitches, but I'm so grateful for all the questions and I really wish I was there with you and I look forward to buying you a beer at the next available opportunity and my love to everyone and hope to see you all in Mexico next year. Uh, Jan, thank you very much for a splendid presentation. Uh, I'm very happy that we could enjoy it despite all the technical difficulties at the beginning. And thumbs up to you that uh, you carried on uh, despite the problems uh, that uh, we were facing. So uh, I think it, it was perfect beginning of the conference. And let me just emphasize that uh, this is not 
the end of discussions related to Jan's uh, talk because uh, this platform makes it possible to connect with Jan, ask him uh, way more questions. You can not only uh, watch this talk again, but you can uh, contact Jan, you can uh, make a video chat with him in this platform. So uh, this is not the end of discussions, this is the very beginning. And the same goes for all the following uh, presentations that we will have at this conference. Let me just uh, point out that uh, there will be 180 or up to 180 presentations at the conference and uh, the advantage of this platform is that you can attend all of them uh, at the big conferences with uh, several parallel sessions it is inevitable that you miss something whereas here you can enjoy the conference from the very beginning to the end uh, you can watch everything and in fact, uh, we have prepared a special prize for those who will watch all the presentations at the conference. So if you do, just let us know and uh, we, we have a little something for you. Once again, Jan, thank you very much uh, for wonderful opening of the conference. Now we have a 30 minutes break. Uh, put your kettles on, uh, make your tea, coffee, and uh, we will... Uh, meet again in uh, breakup sessions in certain minutes. And for those who are presenting, I would like just to remind once again uh, that it's better to be there 15 minutes uh, before the start to avoid any technical problems that might appear. So see you in certain minutes. Good Thank day. you, everyone. Bye.